Well, I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. This week, Marine Month continues as we move from the beach into the open water. We're going to be making waves, tracking whale sharks and lighting up corals. Plus, in the news, a personalised vaccine for skin cancer and the science at play on the courts at Wimbledon. Hello, I'm Chris Smith and this is The Naked Scientist. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. First this week, scientists in Cambridge have developed a new technique to grow replacement bile ducts for patients with liver disease. Some children are born with a defective or a blocked bile duct, and some adults develop diseases affecting the bile duct system later in their life. But in both cases, the results can be lethal or require a transplant if the condition isn't treated. Fotis Sampaziotis, who's a liver specialist at Addenbrooke's Hospital, took me through what he and his colleagues have discovered how to do. To give you an idea of what the bile ducts are, the bile ducts form a network of tubes in the liver. Their purpose is to transfer bile, which is a toxic product of liver metabolism, from the liver to the gut where it helps with digestion. It's a waste disposal system effectively, and a waste disposal system doesn't sound very important. But you can imagine what happens when that waste disposal system breaks down. So the toxic bile overflows into the liver, damages it to the point where we sometimes have to change the whole liver. And all this starts from having a problem or a blockage in one small tube. If we could replace this tube, then we could go back and solve a very big problem later on, that of liver transplantation. And this is what inspired us to start looking into making a bioengineered or an artificial um, organ incorporating human cells, which, uh, which is what we did in the lab. Talk me through what it looks like in the dish then. So you'd start with a sample of, say, my liver. Take me from there. So we would start with a sample of um, the tubes of the liver, which is a sample of a bile duct, or we would start with a sample of someone's gallbladder. The next thing we would do is we would put these cells in a dish and grow them out for a few weeks. And what we would see is the cells proliferating, and then we end up with very, very large number of cells. The second important bit is that what we managed to do is get these cells to now grow onto a multitude of materials called scaffolds. And they lend to the cells sort of the structure, the mechanical strength and properties that they need to move from cells to tissue, which you can manipulate, you can suture in place, and most important for us, you can fashion and engineer into an organ. Of course, when you say structure, it's one thing having a sheet of cells growing in a dish, but that doesn't make a tube which could then be implanted somewhere, and that's what you're saying, the next step is, having got the cells growing, is to persuade them to form the right shapes and and become something useful. Exactly, and that's what we did. First, we managed to form a tube with human bile duct cells, which is a bio-artificial bile duct. How big are these tubes? In the human, a centimetre of diameter. However, what we did is um, we tried these constructs in mice, so we had to make a mouse-sized bile duct, and that was less than a millimetre. Does it work? Yes, it worked. So um, it took, I mean, we needed to convince ourselves. So what we thought we would do is um, we would transplant these tubes into animals and then we would do a lot of the tests that we do in patients that your GP would do to you. So liver blood tests. Then what we did is we also did some MRI imaging to make sure that the bile duct was actually in the right place and there was bile flowing through it. So you actually took the tube that would normally connect the liver to the intestine in these animals and replaced it with one you had made yourself using this new strategy and demonstrated it's working. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Goodness. And so that's outside the liver, that tube though, but there are lots of these tubes inside the liver tissue itself, aren't there? So that's presumably a more difficult nut to crack, getting inside the liver to help those tubes if they break. I completely agree. This is the next uh, big challenge. Because these tubes are so small and so many, they're not amenable to surgical intervention. You can't cut one out and put another one in. There's just too many. So in that case, what we think might be extremely useful in the future is to deliver the cells directly into these tubes. And we have ways of accessing these tubes and we could potentially inject the cells. That for us is, a, is an area of major interest. 
What was the big breakthrough here that meant you were able to do this? Because growing some cells from bits of the body in a dish is, is something scientists have been doing for 100 years. So what was the step change that meant you could now actually get this to turn into something useful? What we did that we think made a difference is we grew these cells in a new culture system, in 3D culture conditions. We embedded them in a drop of gel. And what the cells do then is they form small tubular structures. And once you have a tube as opposed to a single sheet of cells, it's far easier for the cells to roll back to their everyday routine and keep performing their functions. So in other words, the cells we believe were more functional. Now that was one of the major problems because as I said, bile is very toxic. If the cell becomes comfortable in the dish and forgets how to fight off the bile and then all of a sudden you expose it to a highly toxic environment, the cell will probably not have time to readjust and might die. However, if you keep them in an environment where they maintain their function, it's so much easier to go back to their um, natural niche, to their natural environment. Isn't science wonderful? That was Fotis Sampaziotis talking to me on the banks of a very serene river cam, and he's just published that work in the journal Nature Medicine. Well, technology now, and entrepreneur and angel investor Peter Cowley is with us. And Peter, this week you've been looking at a study which is considering how we should programme morals into driverless cars. Tell us more. Hello, Chris. Yes, a very interesting study, a German uh, academic published in Frontiers of Behavioural Neuroscience. But if you don't mind, I'm just going to back up slightly first in this car and just mention some of the f- facts and figures about deaths on the roads, unfortunately. Worldwide, there are about one and a half million deaths on the road a year. But the UK is actually one of the f- top five safest, but we still have 1,700 deaths a year. And t- depending on the country, something between 70 and 90 odd percent are due to human error. And the studies have shown that that should drop by at least 90%. So that's down from 1,700 to um, 170 or so in the UK. Why will those lives be saved? Those lives will be saved because the accidents won't happen. So cars will not hit each other and cars will avoid, in most cases, in not all cases, hitting a human being, another human being, either on the on a bicycle or whatever. So the pros of autonomous vehicles or self-driving vehicles are huge reduction in CO2, mainly because the cars will be used sort of 80% of the time rather than 4% of the time. Huge financial saving because we won't all need to own cars. Huge amount of space released uh, for car parks. A great improvement improvements in the ability of elderly, the blind and disabled to be mobile, which will probably fit in with me because I'm 61 now and at least probably be 10 to 20 years away, and vast improvement in productivity. The cons are mainly going to be labour losses in the car manufacturers, in repair shops, etc., insurance. Now let's talk then about the, the question of morals because the one thing you have mentioned is yes they'll be a lot safer but this still means that there is a blame game problem because at the moment if I get in my car I have an accident it's clear that if I've caused it I'm to blame if the other driver caused it they're to blame if you've got a computer driving your car we have a problem. That's correct. At some point, there's no doubt, whatever it is, there will be death still on the road. And at some point, somebody, some system somewhere, written by a human being, has got to make a decision about what to hit. Now, in principle, I think it should be argued that the person in the car, the occupant of the car, even though they're not driving, is, although maybe not to blame, is the person who possibly should be the most likely to be damaged. And bear in mind that, of course, you're inside a metal box, which is very, very safe anyway. What did they do in this present study? In this study, there were basically 100 or so people who were asked to wear a VR, virtual reality headset, and they were driving along, they were seen driving along in a lane with a variety of inanimate objects, animals, humans, so dogs, males, females, and it was foggy. And the fog suddenly lifted, and they were given between one and four seconds time to make a decision about whether to go straight on or whether to veer off. And if they went straight on, something would happen, some people would die, including themselves possibly, and if they veered off, another set of people or themselves would die. And the result was that they have worked out that the dog was the most valuable animal, more valuable than the cat. Children were more valuable than adults, not surprisingly, and females very much more uh, valuable than males. In other words, the drivers are coming along and they're deciding. Their split-second decisions are, I'm going to save the child to spare the adult, or I'm going to save the female to spare the male. Very, very difficult in the one second. How much processing can you do? It's got to be done on instinct then, hasn't it? Four seconds, you might have just enough time to process it, but not one second. So that's what a person would do. How do we code that into a computer, or do we want to? 
Exactly, exactly. Can we just compare with medical ethics? Uh, NICE has to make decisions as well, doesn't it, about whether to save a life or not. That's done with huge amounts of time and huge amounts of data. In this situation, you've got a very short time. Now, a computer has got a very much longer time, but it still can't make a decision necessarily whether or should not make a decision about which um, adult. Maybe an animal is of less value than a human, but a human is still of the ultimate value. What are we actually going to do then off the back of this study? What is their decision or what is their they're saying the conclusion is we should so do X? They, they've come up with 20 rules. And my German's a bit rusty now. I left about 35 years ago, but I flicked through it. The rules basically are that autonomous systems in principle should be adopted if they're going to cause less accidents. That's almost a given. The people must be protected. A very important one, the state defines the rules. Not the technology company, not the car manufacturer. The state will make the rules. The system cannot be distinguished by sex, age, or size, etc. And then there's a number of rules, or, or, or sort of guidelines about data security ownership and data logging. And if you take those guidelines and ask, were those guidelines in place with the decisions the humans made, would the, the computer be making different decisions to the humans or the same one? Well, that's the big question, isn't it, Chris? It could be done by machine learning. If there was enough data out there, they could learn. And then that would actually adopt the way that humans would behave. Or, yeah. um, But in principle, it's almost impossible to work out how they can make this decision, which is why this, this has all been brought into the public domain so early, to have debates. But the thing is, it is really important because when we start making not one but a million of these electric cars, then the software that's in one will be propagated into a million. And so the decision that one makes will be the same decision a million makes. So we have to get this right. Yeah, funny enough, I don't think it will, because I think the different car manufacturers will have different algorithms. I don't think there'll be a global algorithm for this. <laughs> but you're right, this still needs to be got, something needs to be got right. So what do you think at home? Should the autonomous car, if there's a child in the road and an adult on the pavement, should the autonomous child do what the human would, which is swerve off onto the pavement and kill the adult to spare the child? Or should it mow down the baby? You tell us. Peter, thank you very much you. for joining us. Very thought-provoking discussion. Peter Cowley there. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith. Still to come, the science behind Wimbledon, and I head out to Australia's Ningaloo Reef in search of the world's biggest fish. But first, it's time now for this week's Down to Earth, where we take a look at the tech that was intended for space that has since come down here and found a new home on Earth. And this week, physicist Stuart Higgins is hearing how the Indian space programme is throwing seafarers a lifeline. What happens when the science and technology of space comes down to Earth? Welcome to Down to Earth from The Naked Scientists, the mini-series that explores how space tech is used here on Earth. I'm Dr Stuart Higgins, and this episode we're looking at how India's space programme is helping to save fishermen's lives. The Indian Space Research Organisation, otherwise known as ISRO, was formed in 1969. It aims to use space technology for national development as well as scientific research. As part of this mission, ISRO created the Indian National Satellite System, a series of satellites that although being in space, are very much pointed back down towards Earth. They house instruments for weather monitoring, as well as radio transmitters for telecommunications, TV broadcasts, and also search and rescue operations. And it's that latter category that led to a space tech spin-off, the Distress Alert Transmitter. It's an emergency beacon that can be attached to fishing boats and used to contact the Coast Guard in case of emergencies. And while similar systems were already available, the ISRO system took advantage of the Indian National Satellite System to provide continuous coverage for the Indian Ocean. This is because the satellites are placed in a geostationary orbit. The speed with which a satellite orbits the Earth depends upon its height above the surface. Objects in low Earth orbits of a few hundred kilometres travel faster than those higher up. This means they orbit the Earth multiple times per day. In the case of an emergency beacon, it's critical for the distress signal to get through at any time of day, not just when the satellite happens to be orbiting overhead. One way to achieve this is to place the satellite into geostationary orbit, which is about 36,000 kilometres above the Earth's surface. At this orbit, the relative motion of the satellite matches the rotation of the Earth, so the satellite effectively sits above the same point on the equator without changing position. ISRO's Distress Alert Transmitter uses a combination of the Indian National Satellite System and the Global Positioning System, GPS. So in the event of an emergency on board a boat, the Distress Alert Transmitter is activated by pressing a button corresponding to the type of emergency. Initially, a GPS receiver determines the boat's location. This plus the type of emergency is transmitted via radio up to the Indian National Satellite System. 
a satellite relays the signal back down to a base station on the mainland, alerting the Coast Guard. Although simple to use, the Distress Alert Transmitter relies upon some serious space technology to help save lives. That was Down to Earth from the Naked Scientists, and join me again soon to learn about more space technology that's changing lives back on Earth. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, Stuart will be getting into DIY next time when the cordless drill will be coming down to Earth. In the last 10 years or so, the rates of malignant melanoma, which is a form of skin cancer, have doubled. But our ability to cure the disease has remained pretty dismal, with five-year survival rates down at around 10% for people who present with a cancer that's already spreading. This week, there's some good news, though. A pair of papers published by researchers in Germany and in the US have described techniques for producing personalised anti-cancer vaccines, and these single out chemical differences between a person's cancer cells and their healthy tissues, and then trigger T-cells, which are immune cells, to attack exclusively the cancer. It relies on the fact that cancers make a lot of genetic spelling mistakes, these are called mutations, when they copy their DNA. And this is what introduces the differences that are recognised by the vaccine. Kathy Wu leads the US team at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. We were able to take tumour specimens, sequence them, so understand what was the entire DNA content of those melanomas, and then using new computer tools predict which of those mutations could potentially be seen by the immune response as tags that mark the cancer as different. So essentially, you are comparing what's normal for that person from healthy tissue with what's happened to the genetics of their cancer to see if there are changes there that will be reflected in the way the cell appears on its surface, markers that the immune system might be able to spot that will be specific to the cancer and will be absent from a healthy cell in any other part of the body. Exactly. What makes our vaccine different than what has been generated previously is it's not a one-size-fits-all, but rather that it's personalised and tailored to the individual cancer that we are studying. And roughly how many markers do you get for each patient? We get hundreds to thousands of mutations, but only a subset of them are going to be displayed in a format that the immune system can see. But even from those, we have several hundred from which we can prioritise and choose. So we selected the top 20 hits that we could predict, and that's what the vaccines were composed of. So having identified these DNA differences, the mutations that single out the tumour compared with the healthy tissue, you then work out what those genes would turn into on the cell surface in terms of these these chemical markers. And you, what, make an artificial form of those chemical markers, which is going to form the basis of your vaccine. Right. So that artificial form is what we call a peptide. It is a string of building blocks of proteins, and they have that change generated by the mutation. So if you can imagine that we have up to 20 of these strings of amino acids and we put it into a syringe and we give it together with an immune stimulant and we do give a series of injections, five over the first three weeks and then two boosters, the idea is that immune stimulant sends out the signal for immune cells to come into the vaccine site, gather up those peptides, and then display it to the immune response where a cascade of events then lead to the calling of that army of T cells that might then recognize the patient's tumor cells. Now, how long does it take to make one of these vaccines? Because one of the things about cancer is People don't want to hang around, and we know that holding up treatment could actually lead to a disease acceleration or the disease progressing. So how long does it take you to get this ready to go and into a patient for each person? For our study, it required up to three months. However, there is no reason this could not be created within four to six weeks. Now, critically, did it work, Cathy? Did you get... T-cells capable of combating the tumours in these people, first question. And second question, did those cells actually combat tumours? 
We have to remember that this was a phase one study, meaning that this was our first foot out the door and our goals were safety and feasibility. In that, we definitely succeeded. So we were able to show that this whole procedure caused very, very minimal side effects. The other goal that we had was asking, could they generate a strong immune response? And there we were also very successful. We identified very, very strong immune responses that we could pick up in the blood. And finally, we could demonstrate that those immune responses could clearly not only circulate, but also recognize the patient's own tumor. The best measure of whether or not we were successful is whether or not the patients did well in the long term. We observed our patients for two years or more, and they have been without evidence of disease return. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? That was Kathy Wu, and you'll be pleased to hear that Kathy is also now looking at using the same technique to trigger immune responses against a host of other cancers, including ovarian cancer and bowel tumours. The work she was talking about was published in Nature. Now, grab your rackets, your strawberries and ice cream, and, as long as you're old enough, also a glass of Pims, because Wimbledon is, of course, underway. And to celebrate, we're having a rally of our very own. And it's a match of the titans today. Georgia Mills and Tom Crawford have come armed with their top tennis facts. It's anyone's guess who will be crowned champion. It's your quickfire science on Wimbledon. And they're off. Once upon a time, tennis rackets were made out of wood, which was weak and warped over time. But now we use carbon fibres set in glue, which is high strength and low weight. And not all rackets are vegetarian. Some strings are made from cow intestines, but most are the polymer nylon. If you hit the ball in a certain way, you create topspin, which makes the ball fall sooner than a ball without it. This relies on something called the Magnus effect. Whilst the ball is spinning through the air, a thin layer of air around it is also rotating, and the differences in pressure between the air on top and the bottom of the ball creates a force. This is what pushes the ball faster towards the ground and is why you have to use topspin with your balls if you want to be too fast for your opponent. Rafael Nadal is one of the best and can spin a ball at 3,600 RPMs. Over the course of Wimbledon, they sell around 320,000 glasses of Pims. If one person managed to drink that and miraculously didn't die, it would take around 36 years to sober up. Cheers! Wimbledon is one of the very few tournaments to still use grass, instead of clay or acrylic. The grass used is perennial ryegrass, scientific name Lullium perenne, because of its resistance to wear and impressive regeneration capabilities. Grass courts make it slightly less predictable where the ball is going to bounce, but also makes for a faster game. This is because grass as a surface isn't very even and also has less friction. The winner of a coin toss decides if they want the first serve, but the odds aren't exactly 50-50. Coins have a 51% chance of landing on the side that was face down at the start. Plus, some statistics have shown a very small advantage to being the first serve on the first set, although this effect does seem to disappear if the players are very evenly matched. It's not just balls that are served. Over 28,000 kilograms of strawberries are consumed by hungry punters. That's the equivalent weight of four African elephants. Luckily, there's 10,000 litres of cream on hand to go with them. The ball's yellow colour may be iconic, but Wimbledon used traditional white balls until 1986. The yellow ball first started being used when research showed they showed up better on television. Each tennis ball is hollow and is filled with a gas, which is usually nitrogen, that's held at a pressure higher than the air outside. This means that over time the gas leaks out, which is why the balls need to be replaced. And this is why when you open a new can of balls, you get that lovely popping sound as the cans are pressurised to keep the balls in tip-top condition. And it's also why you'll often see the players squeezing their balls on the pitch to see if the pressure is good enough. Game, set, match. What a game, ladies and gentlemen. What a game. Thank you very much, Georgia Mills and Tom Crawford there, slugging out the quickfire science of tennis.
You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith. And it's our second programme in a series of four exploring the largest habitat on Earth, the ocean. Last week, we looked at coasts and beaches, so this time we're getting our feet a bit wetter as we move out into coastal waters. You'll hear how I ended up in the ocean alongside the world's largest fish. We'll discover how corals glow to power their survival at depth and the story of the underwater warfare unleashed by the sea anemone. But first... Before we go under the water, we're taking a look at what goes on on the surface. Waves are ubiquitous in the marine world, but how do we study them and why do they matter? Tom Crawford went along to Cambridge University's maths department to meet researcher Megan Davies-Wicks. This is uh, what we call the solitary wave tank. So it's a very long tank that we can use to produce waves. I'm not going to lie, it looks like about a 10 metre long fish tank to me. (laughs) That's pretty accurate. (laughs) It seems to be filled about mid-depth, so maybe 30, 40 centimetres of water. Is this this fresh water, salt water? Yeah, this is just normal tap water. Okay, great. And how are we going to be generating waves? Because at the moment it all looks very still and nice and very tranquil. So I've got a paddle here. And if I move the paddle backwards and forwards, it creates waves in my tank that have various uh, frequencies and wavelengths. The wavelength is the distance from the crest to the, to the next crest. So when you say a wave here, imagine almost like a squiggly sort of like sine wave. Exactly. Like the traditional kind of example is imagine a wave along a skipping rope. And the frequency, I'm guessing, is sort of how often these waves appear. So that's going to be to do with how fast we move the paddle. Exactly, yeah. So the waves this tank can make, are they a particular type of wave? So there's a couple of different types of waves. The ones I'm making right now are deep water waves. And they're deep water waves because the depth of the water is quite big compared to the wavelength of the wave. There's another type of wave, which is called shallow water waves. They're when the wavelength is quite large compared to the depth of the water. They're ones you'll you'll see if you're standing on the beach watching the waves come into shore. And something that's quite interesting about shallow water waves is the speed of a shallow water wave depends on the depth. And that means that as these waves are coming in towards the shore, the bit of the wave that's over the shallower bit of the shore goes slower. And the bit of the wave that's over the deeper bit will go faster. So waves will kind of turn in towards the shore. And that's why when you're standing on a beach looking at the waves washing towards you, they're always coming like straight towards you. The big question is, Megan, can I have a go? Absolutely. If you move it backwards and forwards, and we can create waves. And these waves are actually going all the way down the other end of the tank and splashing onto a sort of beach we have at the other end. Right, so what you're going to do is waggle this paddle backwards and forwards um, to make a wave. And we're going to do this twice. And the first time, I want you to move the paddle all the way from one end to the other and back again. And then the second time, I want you to maybe move it halfway and then back again, but do this at the same frequency. Okay, so I'm, I'm moving the paddle forwards and then backwards, so in the direction the wave's going to travel. And you want me to do this for a really long stroke the first time. And then the second time, you want me to do it at the same frequency, but only move it halfway. Yeah, exactly. Okay, right. This is going to be experiment number one then. This is a nice big stroke of the paddle and go okay how long did it take it took 4.5 seconds four and a half seconds okay so it's four and a half seconds for our wave to go the full length of the tank and now experiment number two i'm only going to move the paddle halfway along and in order for it to move at the same frequency i've got to move it half as fast so i'm actually going to move the paddle a little bit slower here, but the frequency will be the same because the paddle is only moving half the distance. Ready? I'm going to make a guess here. I may regret this, but surely because in the second experiment I've moved the paddle half as fast, surely the wave is going to be slower. So no. So the two waves moved at the same speed. So the second one also took four and a half seconds? Exactly, yeah. Both waves you made had the same frequency, or pretty close. And for the waves we're creating, uh, the frequency sets the wavelength. 
and the wavelength sets the speed for deep water waves. So because we had the same frequency, they traveled at the same speed. So it didn't matter really how far I was moving the paddle backwards and forwards to push the wave along. Because I kept the frequency the same and the frequency sets the speed, then that's why we got the same time for the wave to travel to the end of the tank. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, what you were changing when you um, moved the paddle further is actually you were changing the amplitude of the wave. So the, the height difference from the, from the crest to the trough. They did look a little bigger, actually. <laughs> That was quite a fun experiment. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I, I did enjoy making some waves in, in this pretty much giant fish tank. But, of course, you actually do real scientific research here in the fluids lab at Cambridge. So can you tell me what kind of things do you look at? Something we're very interested in is mixing in the ocean. And there's waves inside the ocean, just like there are waves on top of the ocean. And these waves are called internal waves. These internal waves are really important for what goes on inside the ocean. And we're able to, in this tank, run experiments where we are able to recreate internal waves just like they appear in the ocean. So it's a case of we have data from real internal waves in the ocean, but it's very hard to obtain and it's very hard to measure and study them sort of in the ocean. You know, you have to go out on a boat and whatnot. So you're sort of saying we take the data that we have and then use it to recreate the real world situation in this lovely controlled environment in the lab where we can really study it and really understand what's happening. Yeah, exactly. And why are internal waves important and why do we need to know more about ocean mixing? So if you want to make models of the ocean, you really need to understand how it works. And internal waves and mixing are really important to that. And if we understand how it works, then we can build models of it and understand how things like climate change are going to affect the ocean. Megan Davies Wicks making waves about waves there with Tom Crawford. Well, now it's time to dive beneath the waves and meet one of the largest animals on Earth. Imagine being in the water alongside a fish the size of a bus and weighing about 10 to 20 tonnes. Well, that's the experience I had last month when I went to the Ningaloo Reef World Heritage Site. It's located off the northwestern coast of Australia, and as well as being the country's largest fringing coral reef, that means it lies close to the shore, it's also home to the whale shark. I went out on one of the boats run by a local dive company that specialises in taking people swimming with the big boys. My name's Frank Gagliardi. My home's here on the Ningaloo Reef, and I uh, take people swimming with whale sharks. So we're standing on a flybridge, so the top part of a 65-foot vessel that's uh, fully equipped for dive and snorkel operations, and we're currently looking at 15 very lovely customers having a swim on, uh, on a patch of uh, coral, coral bombies. Just another day at the office. Yeah, just another day at the office, mate. Very, very lucky, very lucky indeed. It is a wonderful place to work. How do you actually do what you do? Because people are paying your company uh, to, to find them whale sharks to swim with, but how do you do that? We keep it as simple as possible. So we have a charter company, plane company that is in town, and we hire our own plane or charter our own plane every day um, that searches the back of the reef for whale sharks. And it's just one singular guy in the aircraft who uh, gets a bit dizzy circling around all day and he's looking out the side of the aircraft and uh, he'll spot them. And then he gives us a bearing. So basically just a very rough idea. It's in, you say, your 12 o'clock or your 1 o'clock uh, by about 500 metres to a mile. Uh, once we get close enough to the whale shark, then I'll usually pick him up by sight from the boat. And uh, then we can look at sticking to our guidelines, how we act and drive around the whale shark to you know, impede it as least as possible. I'm Dr Brad Norman. I'm uh, from the not-for-profit group called Ecocean. Works on whale sharks in, in Australia and does some work overseas. Oh, whale sharks are a fantastic creature. They're the biggest fish in the sea. They can get up to 18 metres in length, but they are a gentle giant. They're a filter feeder, a huge animal, but we get to see them in their natural environment. And to see this huge creature that's of no danger to us covered in a beautiful pattern of spots um, that we can get within a few metres while swimming alongside them is a truly an amazing experience. It is a beautiful pattern they have. Just describe that because I don't think I can do it justice. Yeah, no, that's, it is beautiful. Well, the shark's skin is quite a dark colour, sort of a browny, bluey colour, grey even. But all across the animal is uh, it's spots, white spots. Some of them are quite small, but some of, some of them are the size of a tennis ball. But those spots are set in a, in a pattern that's unique to each individual. It's actually like a fingerprint. And you can use that to identify them, can you? 
Yeah, we, we do, and that's something that we sort of initiated up here at Ningaloo Reef, and now it's a global program where we can actually identify individual animals through the spot pattern and determine whether that same individual is, being, is returning on a, on a daily, a weekly, a monthly basis or in years to come, or if there's a lot of new individuals coming to Ningaloo Reef every year. Do they migrate these fish, or do you have a population of whale sharks here in this patch of, of Australian coastline that stay here all the time? We've been able to identify a lot of individual whale sharks from Ningaloo Reef, and in fact some of them have been sent, or I've photographed them, over a 22-year period. So they've come back every year, or almost every year, for that period of time. Now, it's a couple of sharks, but there's many sharks that we see on a regular basis, even a yearly basis, but there's a lot of new ones that come through, and there's a lot of ones that we don't get to see again. So there's, there's a transient and a sort of a resident group of sharks that come to Ningaloo. So what is their range globally, then? Well, they are broadly distributed right around the globe, between about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. It's sort of in that warm water tropical band, but the sharks are um, distributed all around the globe, but it's only been in recent years that hotspots have been found in, in various parts of the world. Is it a coincidence that some of the biggest animals on Earth are the ones that eat the smallest things? Because the, you say they're filter feeders, they're filtering out, in some cases, microscopic things to eat. Pretty much. They can, they can filter down to literally only a couple of millimetres in length in these animals. You know, they've got a lot of protein in some of these small copepods or krill or, or small crustaceans. Um, they, they can feed on small fish and, uh, and, and larger animals, but, yeah, they, um, they seem to be able to find and target and, and, and survive um, by feeding the smallest organisms. What's the actual practicality of that filter feeding? How do they do it? Well, basically, there's two ways of doing it, the, um, well, what, can, what we can see. It's a lot of the time the plankton, the, the zooplankton, comes to the surface of an evening um, and concentrates. And the whale sharks actually target those concentrations. So they actually swim through, just swim like, like a normal shark, through, through these patches. In fact, um, with their mouth um, agape, uh, and it's called basically ram filter feeding through the uh, the top of the top of the water column, and it comes through. It gets filtered through the filter pads in their in their mouth, and then the water goes back out through the uh, the gills, and they they take in all that food. That's one way. There's another way that whale sharks feed, and I've just got back from the Maldives where they've been feeding in this manner, where they sit vertical in the water, uh, and there might be a concentration of prey at the surface, and they basically suck water in, and they suck that water in, they filter it out, and they go on their merry way. When you say they filter it out, how do they do that? Well, they've got, got filter pads um, inside their, inside their, their buccal cavity, and uh, basically it's just a cross-flow filtration across those pads that seems to pull out the small organisms, and um, then they can you know, feed on them. And How do they know when they've got a mouthful, then? Well... We need to ask one of them, don't we? You know, there's a lot of new stuff we need to find out about whale sharks. I mean, I've been studying them for a long time, but just as an example, there's still there's still not very much known about whale sharks. The last, I think, up until the mid-1980s, um, I, I got involved soon after that, there'd only been 320 confirmed sightings of whale sharks globally. And given that these animals have been around for millennia, or for millions of years virtually, it's pretty amazing. And... They were only first discovered by science in 1828. So even though they've been around, you know, for a long, long time, they've, they're quite cryptic and they tend to stay away from places or, or through history where, people, where we've been. And they really haven't been a commercial resource until, you know, the, in, the, in the 80s, virtually, when fishing came in for whale sharks. So there wasn't a lot known about them. There's still a lot we need to know about them, but it's an exciting species because... Given that they're the biggest fish in the sea, we know so little about them, but we're starting to find out new stuff all the time. And um, it's really, really important for science, but hopefully it's going to be really important for the conservation of the biggest fish in the sea. And believe me, it was an absolutely amazing experience to be swimming alongside and photographing from just a few metres away, those enormous animals. And I can completely understand why Brad Norman, whom you heard there on the boat with me, and before him, the skipper, Frank Gagliardi, from Ningaloo Whale Shark and Dive, are just so entranced by them. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Chris Smith. If you'd like to get in touch, it's chris at thenakedscientist.com. Find us on Facebook or you can tweet at Naked Scientists. 
On the way, we'll be finding out about the corals that glow in the dark. But before that, we're heading back to Ningaloo Reef, where not only did I manage to go swimming with whale sharks, I also caught up with Ecocean's marine biologist Sam Reynolds. Now, her job is to track these magnificent creatures because we don't actually know where they go across the world's oceans. First, here's Brad Norman again. We're trying to find out their migration using some satellite tracking to see where these animals are travelling when we don't get a chance to see them or take photographs of them. Doesn't that mean you have to catch a 12 metre long fish in order to tag it? Not quite. We have to do this in situ. I have to actually swim alongside a very large shark and put a tag on his dorsal fin while I'm swimming along. Cause How does the shark take to that? Well, we've been very, very careful over the years. We're making sure that the, the work that we do is minimal impact especially with the tagging. So we want to cause as as less hassle to the animals um, as we can. So we've got a very simple but a very low-impact tag that we actually clamp on the dorsal fin. And um, that seems to stay on and the shark doesn't even react, which is fantastic. Oh, so rather than actually having to make an injury by penetrating the cartilage of the fin to hold the tag in, you're not doing that, which is, which is one way of doing it. You're actually having something that lightly attaches for long enough for you to get data. Correct, yeah, and the idea is using a spring clamp, we can just sort of pressure onto the dorsal fin. Now, that's not going to stay on forever, which is fine, because the last thing we want is these tags to remain on and fester and cause damage and so on to the animal. The, the idea is specific that these clamps and tags will stay on only for a period of time after which they will fall away and leave no damage on the animal and we've got evidence to show that when we've recited individuals that we've tagged the year before, clamps, tags come off, no damage to the fin. You said this is to monitor migration patterns so you must therefore be using something like GPS or, or satellite monitoring or something. That uses radio signals. And they don't work underwater. So how are you getting around that? Yeah, well, that's very interesting. Well, what we found out was that the satellite transmissions don't go through water. So satellite tracking works well for a land-based animal or a dolphin or a whale or a turtle or dugong or something that comes up for air. Whale sharks are a shark. They don't need to come to the surface. However, we used a different type of tag to understand more about the general uh, behaviour of whale sharks. It's called a daily diary. And we were able to establish that at certain times, usually dawn and dusk, whale sharks, while they're feeding at the surface, their actual dorsal fin is out of the water. And so if we put a tag on that dorsal fin, it won't be pinging all day every day, but it will get enough transmissions to find out the the position of that animal over a period of time. Hi, my name is Samantha Reynolds. I'm a marine biologist and I work with Ecocean on whale sharks and we're here at Ningaloo Reef. It's my job to download the transmissions that we get from the satellite tags. We do this from a website. The satellite company collects the data for us and we log into the website, download the data, gives us a position and a time and a date of when the whale sharks are at the surface. And then we take this data and we upload it to another website which then visualises the data and it's a public website so anyone can go to the website and and see the tracks of the whale sharks that we're getting. Where do they go? (laughs) Good question. We've tracked a lot of them north from Ningaloo, north, northeast, northwest. We had one shark that travelled all the way to the south coast of Java in Indonesia and we also had one shark that travelled all the way down to near... Rottnest Island off Perth. A few sharks visited Shark Bay. The the pattern that we're getting from the whale sharks is that they seem to stay in coastal waters. These are mostly juvenile males that we're tagging and so we think that they're staying closer to the coast. We've also had the first uh, fully tracked return migrations of whale sharks to Ningaloo Reef. What does that mean? (laughs) We tagged the whale sharks here at Ningaloo Reef. We watched them move away from Ningaloo Reef. For my analysis, I said at least 300 kilometres away from where they were tagged. And then we watched them come back again. And the interesting thing is that it's thought generally that whale sharks aggregate at Ningaloo Reef in the winter. But from the tracking that we've been doing, it looks like they're actually returning throughout the year. We had sharks returning in September, October, January. So it looks like they could be using Ningaloo Reef all year round, which is really interesting. The ones that we were swimming with today were huge. Uh, They were maybe eight metres long. It's the size of a big bus bobbing around in the water with you. (laughs) But 
what may surprise many people, and it certainly surprised me, was that's not a big animal. They get much no, bigger than that. they can get a lot bigger than that. They can get up to 18 to 20 metres, we think. And at around 8 to 9 metres, they're starting to get mature. And so we think that these coastal aggregations or collections of whale sharks, if you like, are the juveniles and that they're sort of building up their strength maybe. And then as they get bigger and mature, maybe they move further offshore maybe to find a mate. Yeah. And why is it so important to study them? Because there are, to use a horrible phrase, plenty more fish in the sea. Why are these <laughs> ones important? They're the biggest fish in the sea. They're the top of their food chain. We don't really know what the effect would be of taking them out of, the, of that food chain. And do we really want the biggest fish in the sea to become extinct under our watch? I certainly don't. So I think it's important that we study their threats and where they're going and try and understand their movements so that we can protect them and areas that are important to them. And the conservation of those animals is an enormous priority. They're on the endangered list and their numbers have halved in the last 75 years, we think largely owing to human pressure. That was Sam Reynolds and before her, Brad Norman. They're both from Ecotion. Now, what attracts the whale sharks that we were talking about to Ningaloo are the coral reefs close to shore. But corals don't just inhabit shallow waters. In some places on Earth, they live at much greater depths, although it was never clear how they survive, nearly 100 metres down or so. Now, a new paper announced this week at the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition in London has the answer. From his exhibit at the Royal Society, Southampton University's Jörg Wiedemann is with us to explain. Hello, Jörg. Tell us, first of all, what actually is coral? Corals are animals and it's in fact a colony of animals, so you have multiple polyps and they live together in various depths in coral reefs and they host little algal cells inside of their tissue and since they're attached to the rocks they behave a little bit like plants, so they need light for their survival. Okay, so we have an animal which has an algal cell, which is a kind of plant living with it, one feeding the other. Where does the hard, rocky bit of the coral come from? So that is uh, secreted by the animal cells and uh, they deposit it underneath it. So they sit on top of this skeleton, but the algal partner, they help potentially also with that by facilitating the deposition of the limestone material. And why are people concerned that corals are in jeopardy? around the world, these sort of shallow dwelling corals on the Barrier Reef around Australia, for example. We hear a lot about that. Why? So when uh, sea surface temperatures rise, um, the photosynthetic algae, they become un- malfunctioning and then the symbiotic relationship breaks down and the algal cells are lost from the animal. And as a consequence of that, the white skeleton shines through the animal tissue and, and that gives the corals this ghostly white appearance. And this is why this phenomenon is called coral bleaching. When the corals don't recover their algal symbionts, then they usually die sooner or later. But this is the surface-dwelling corals. The ones that live deeper are not so much under threat. Is that right? Well, it's, it's not just the temperature that causes bleaching. It's, it's this multifactorial, while temperature is the major driver, also light plays a critical role and also the nutrient um, content in the water. And so there, there is a hypothesis out there that corals in deeper water may actually be more protected from this bleaching because they, while they might be exposed to temperature stress, the light stress certainly will be lower. Now, if the coral relies on exposure to sunlight because those algal cells, the plant-type cells that live alongside the coral creatures and feed them by capturing sunlight and doing photosynthesis, if they depend on light to do that, surely as you go deeper down in the water to the kind of deep water corals that you've been studying, down 100 metres down or so, they don't have much light down there. So how do they get enough light for their algal cells to feed the coral? So this is what the paper was about. So we looked at corals that have a particular type of orange fluorescent pigment. So, and we find that in um, corals that live in depths between 20 up to 80 meters. And these pigments, they take up the blue light that is prevalent at these greater water depths and they convert it into orange light. 
And interestingly, this orange light then can travel deeper into the coral colony and make sure that the symbiotic algae in deeper tissue layers can actually photosynthesize despite being exposed to relatively low light levels. Gosh, that's ingenious. So the deep water corals are making a chemical that converts the blue light that is present in the water at depth into an orange colour that can drive the algae, make them photosynthesise. Exactly, that's the the mechanism. Goodness, that means that the deeper water corals are doing something quite different from the surface corals then. So some people have suggested, well, won't it be okay with climate change and rising water temperature because the ones that live near the surface could just migrate to deeper waters? The fact that these deep-dwelling corals have evolved this very special way of living would, would argue that actually corals couldn't just move deeper to get away from climate change. Yeah, that is one of the concerns that arises from this study because it shows how sophisticated this symbiosis is, how well adapted they are to the life in this greater depth. And also previous studies have found that other corals, uh, they use different types of symbiotic algae to adjust to life in greater depth or some of the others um, change their, their growth morphology so they become very broad and form some sorts of light collectors. So, so they respond in, in various different ways and not all shallow water corals will be able to do the same. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you. We must leave it there. That's Jörg Wiedemann from the University of Southampton. But in the meantime, Tom Crawford has been touring Jörg's coral exhibition for himself. Jörg has brought me inside a, a very darkly lit room and he's holding a, I think, a UV flashlight. Blue, it's blue light, so it's 450 nanometers. OK, yeah, so he's got a blue flashlight which is shining on a mini sort of fish tank or like little paddling pool filled, filled with about 10 centimetres of water and there's all kinds of glowing creatures and like rocks and are these, are these corals that I'm looking at? No, what you're looking here is sea anemones, and they are actually our local stars. So they come from the Dorset coast, they come from Kimmeridge Bay, and also from the Isle of Wight. And you can see two different species here. So you have with the green tentacles here the snake log anemones, and here the strawberry anemone. So the strawberry anemone that would be usually red with green dots. We see here only the green dots because they contain one of these fluorescent protein pigments. And do you have any actual corals for me to look at? Sure, we do, so if you want to move over here. In this other tank, we have our tropical corals here. They are kept at higher temperature. And you have a range of um, species from different parts of the world, from the Great Barrier Reef, from the Caribbean, and also from Fiji. So you can see here, with, if we just shine the torch through the tank, that there's a huge diversity of colors. So we have these greens and yellowish tones, and then you have various shades of red. If you also look down here, so this is a typical shallow water coral and um, in this shallow water corals, uh, the animal uses uh, the fluorescent pigments to shield the symbiotic algae that live inside of the tissue from excess sunlight. So when you say animal there, the coral itself is an animal? Yes, the coral indeed is an animal. It belongs to the same group as the jellyfish and the sea anemones. And um, in the case of the corals, you have many polyps that form a colony. They are attached to each other and they form a, a limestone skeleton on which they sit. So they are rather hard and brittle in contrast to the um, sea anemones or jellyfish, which are quite squishy. If the coral is an animal, then how do they feed? So you can see here colonies of different shapes. In this particular colony, you have rather large polyps. So, so the, one of the polyps is like five centimeters in diameter, so, so they're really unusually big. And you can also see that in the round bit um, around the mouth that they are extending some tentacles. So, so they're behaving uh, like a colony of sea anemones, and they have these stinging cells with which they can capture prey items such as um, tiny crustaceans or little fish and they feed on them. Of course corals are often used to demonstrate the effect human impact on the environment and climate change is having because they seem to be very sensitive to changes in their environment and beyond the fact that they're very beautiful creatures you know is there a real reason why we need to make sure we look after this species? 
Yes, certainly. So you need to bear in mind coral reefs provide a source of income for about half a billion of people in the world. And here you have some very vivid examples. So these pigments can be used in biomedical research, for example, to understand how disease cells work. You can use them to understand how cancer cells function. And then also pharmaceutical industry can use them to develop tests, which they can use to screen for novel drugs. So it's a case of taking the fluorescent pigment out of the coral. So like here, we, when you're shining the blue light, these things are they're really bright they are glowing in the dark pretty much and you're saying you can take this pigment and then put it in a cell that is of interest in a human body and then be able to track that and follow it yes exactly that's what we can do so and here the pigments are encoded by the DNA so this is a very special case that you have a single pigment that is encoded by a single gene so you can take this gene and can transfer it in a cell under study and you can use this then this genetic information to label proteins of interest in living cell systems. Illuminating stuff. Jörg Riedemann there speaking with Tom Crawford. Well we're wrapping up this week with our Critter of the Week. This is a special version of Question of the Week for Marine Month and Georgia Mills has been treading carefully around the sea anemone. Name, sea anemone. Phylum, Cnidaria. Location, sea anemones are common in tropical reefs but they're found in every ocean in the world. Special abilities, expert harpooning and clone warfare. Sarah Lane from Plymouth University makes the case for this contender for Critter of the Week. If you've ever been down to the sea while the tide is out, you may have noticed what appear to be little blobs of strawberry jam covering the surfaces of exposed reefs. These blobs may appear ugly and uninteresting, but when the tide comes in, rings of vibrantly coloured tentacles appear and they are transformed into sea anemones, known for their beauty as the flowers and jewels of the sea. Indeed, sea anemones even take their name from a flower, but plants they are most certainly not. Anemones are related to jellyfish, using stinging tentacles to zap anything edible that comes past. They live in a variety of habitats from the intertidal zone down to offshore reefs and even into the lightless abyss, and can be anywhere from millimetres to metres in diameter. Unlike their buoyant cousins, anemones are generally harmless to humans and spend most of their lives attached to rocks. But don't let their seemingly sedentary lifestyle fool you. Anemones' lives are far from tame. Despite having no central nervous system, sea anemones possess weapons, bead-like structures chock full of stinging harpoons which frame the edge of their bodies. Their sole purpose? To keep other anemones away. Anemones use these harpoons when faced with a nosy neighbour, covering their opponent in flesh-eating stings in an effort to make them retreat. Flesh-eating harpoons. Lovely. But if you think just one sounds like a handful... Some species of anemones even form huge colonies, which act like a single army. Some of the anemones act as scouts, surveying the perimeter for intruders, while other, more heavily armed individuals, take the role of warriors, awaiting the scout's signal. When two colonies meet, a no-man's land forms between them. If any anemone crosses this line, the bloodshed begins, and warriors cover invaders with swathes of stinging harpoons until the white flag is raised and the other colony retreats. These are the Roman army of the water world. But as teams go, these guys take keeping it in the family to a whole new level. These colonies work together as one. And in fact, genetically, they are one. As well as possessing gnarly weapons, anemones can reproduce asexually, meaning that their offspring are clones, and they can form entire armies of mini with which to defend their home. Hello, 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 hello. Pretty cool for a blob of jam. So there's much more to sea anemones than providing a home for Nemo and having a difficult name to say. Name. Sea anemone. Sea anemone. Sea anemone. Between their flesh-eating harpoons and their vicious clone wars, they've won their way to Critter of the Week. And if you would like to nominate a sea critter for us to consider, you can email chris at thenakedscientist.com. Find us on Facebook or tweet at Naked Scientists with your suggestions. That wraps things up for this week. Thank you to our guests, Megan Davies-Wicks, Frank Gagliardi, Brad Norman, Sam Reynolds and Jörg Wiedemann. The producer was Tom Crawford. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University and it's supported by the STFC, the EPSRC and Rolls-Royce. 
I'm Chris Smith, and from us here at the Naked Scientist team, until next time, goodbye.